Oh, thank you, Michael. Um, I, I didn't think once people had heard me, they actually wanted to hear more from me. So that's, that's, that's rather more of an endorsement that I'm used to having. Um, I know that this is the end of your day and you're probably um, winding down and getting a little bit... You can hear me? Uh, winding down and getting a little bit tired. You've probably been bombarded by a whole lot of um, great facts and really interesting things throughout the day. So what I'll try and do is just try and um, keep it light, but also try and keep it as relevant as I possibly can so that um, what I can talk to you about um, in terms of social media um, is something that might be useful for you going forward into the um, back to your day-to-day -day -day jobs. Um, so the first question I just wanted to ask is, um, who here has a Facebook account for uh, personal use? So we're getting quite a lot of you, not all of you, but uh, lots of you. Who's got a Twitter account for um, personal use? Uh, that, personal use. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting question, I, actually. I, I One that you associate with your name. Yes. Yep. So a few of you, so three of you. Um, who's got Facebook um, pages or groups or something that is for, um, for work-related sorts of things? So there's a few of you that are moving into that space already. And then who's got a, a Twitter account that is not necessarily your name but is, is something that represents your work? So there's three of you there. So we've got some experience of um, moving into social media already in the room. And I'm not going to teach you how to um, reinvent the wheel or to, to do your jobs. What I'm going to try and do is talk a little bit about uh, my experience in social media. Uh, the research and, and teaching work that I've done in social media um, and try and make it um, something that we can all you know, have a conversation about. Uh, best practice, best ways to go forward and best things that we can learn from there. So just to give a little bit of a background, um, my centre uh, for the Public Awareness of Science, we're engaged in uh, teaching and research on science communication issues. So some people uh, run the Shell Questacon Science Circus where we do um, uh, science uh, demonstrations, things like that. Other people do uh, research on uh, issues in terms of the relationship between science and society. So um, my PhD students, for example, are looking at uh, how climate change politics works or how uh, wind turbine politics is getting really complicated and interesting. One of the things that we're also looking at is social media and how social media is rapidly becoming a new space where science is communicated. It's clearly not the only space. But it's a, it's a space that's rapidly growing and rapidly changing how a lot of people are receiving their scientific information. One of the things that we're arguing within that is that it doesn't have to take over everything that you're doing, and it certainly shouldn't. But it, it, it provides a useful new way for you to do a lot of different sorts of communication and to connect to audiences that can use your science. Now, this will vary enormously depending on who you are. Uh, if you're a research scientist yourself, um, you can do different things in social media to if you're Questacon or um, Science Technology Australia or if you're a, a, a research organisation focused on a particular topic. And how you use social media will vary enormously uh, based on that. So what I'm going to talk about is just a few things that, um, that I've learned. But please jump in if you have any questions at all um, and would like to know how these different sorts of things work. I'm happy to keep this conversational as much as possible. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is just, for those of you who haven't, haven't seen um, the back end of, of Twitter and Facebook, just talk through a couple of different things about what the different aspects are. Now, if you've seen all this before and you're used to it, just tune out for a couple of minutes. That's okay. I don't mind if you have a nap at the end of the day. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, okay, so uh, Mel, very graciously, because I forgot my password, um, or maybe because my Twitter feed's probably not as polite as, um, as Mel's Twitter feed, um, has put up uh, the Twitter... Um, feed here for ANU research skills that you run, don't you, Mel? Now, on the, there's a lot of text here, and I can, I can imagine if you're new to seeing this that it's, it's quite a complicated amount of text. And it's quite difficult to pass all that to try and, to try and gather meaning. Um, but what I'll do is, is just show you some of the, the base bits of Twitter and try and get a feel for how they work. On the right-hand side are the tweets. The tweets are the, the major bit of what's going on in Twitter. Now, tweets are tiny bits of text. They're a, they're a little bit smaller than is, as is possible in an SMS. But it's that sort of amount. You, you might send a text message to um, your partner or your kids or something like that. A tweet is roughly the same sort of amount. But you can, within that tweet, put out a link to um, something else that explains a lot more detail. So we'll see here, this is a tweet from the Conversation website, which is, um, for those of you who don't know, it's a, um, a daily... Uh, news website that does a lot of science and academic uh, writing. 
The tweet here says, from the conversation, and this is their Twitter handle, which is their unique identifier, what could be cuter than crayfish, the 90 plus creatures who call them home? Now what we've got here is the, the name of the person who wrote, so the person who wrote that article also has a Twitter account, so they have linked to another Twitter account just here using the at symbol. So like the conversation um, EDU has put out that tweet, and this is Dr. Susan Lawler has, has written that article, and they've also mentioned the university that she's from, which is Latrobe, that has a Twitter account, and that there, as uh, Natasha mentioned before, is the link to, the, to the, um, the article. Now, it's a shortened link. Obviously, the actual link would be theconversation.com slash something, 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 which is you know, using the word crayfish. This is a shortened link so that it's not using up as many characters in the tweet. Characters are a, a very precious resource when you've only got 140 of them. There's not very much you can say, so reducing the length of anything um, is an important thing to do. Any questions on what is a tweet there? Michael, are you happy with it so far? I'm with you this far. With me this far? Okay, so if one, was to, if one has decided I'm going to jump in and um, use my Twitter account to start composing a tweet, you can go to the Twitter webpage here, which is twitter.com. It's kind of easy to remember. And Melanie's getting nervous right now. Um, you can go over to this window here that says compose new tweet. It's expanded just here. It's showing that you've got 140 characters to go. So what should we say in here that Melanie really wouldn't like? So this is tweeting from the ANU Research Skills account. Um, Melanie's getting very nervous right now. <laughs> now here's an important thing. Melanie's getting very nervous because a tweet is basically a press release. A lot of people might, ig might ignore it. A lot of people don't care. But if you say something publicly, just because it's 140 characters, just because it's flippant, it's as public as you can get. And it's the fastest thing to be shared on the internet. A tiny bit of text is the fastest thing people can pass around. So, mostly, 99.9% .9 of tweets are innocuous. They're replied to, they give a bit of information. Mostly, you have a trouble trying to get people to pay attention to them. If you have a great one that people pay a lot of attention to, that can be wonderful. But, you do have to be careful. If you are um, sending out a tweet, and this is why Melanie is nervous, that is factually incorrect, that is lies, that is any other thing that you, you really wouldn't want to associate with your brand, it will go out faster than anything else. So that's why people are often quite nervous about uh, sending out a tweet. Now I'll just quickly write one in here so we've got an example here. Um, <laughs> Dr. Uh, that's not, Dr. Willow's app, which happens to be my account for some reason. I got Twitter when I was reading a lot of comics, I think, a few years ago, um, is delivering... Is wearing red pants. Is wearing red pants. Um, I was actually going to say something factual. I mean, that, that, that's factual, I know. Right, not being inflammatory. Right. Well, is delivering... Delivering stimulating. A moderately <laughs> interesting... Stimulating. Now, unfortunately, moder... Can anyone I, spell? I can't. Actually, actually, no. Eight, yeah. really tricky typing on. I'm blaming someone else's tools here. Mod uh, eight. I'm not really familiar. Right. 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 This is really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what. Is blushing, I think we just say now. Moderately <laughs> stimulating. <laughs> Presentation on Twitter basics. You'll notice while I type Twitter there, um, this little window popped up here suggesting maybe, maybe I want to link to another account. Um, in this moment, I don't think there's any purpose to link to Twitter AU. It doesn't really add anything to, the, to there. But I might um, link to Science Technology on Twitter for the wonderful... Science. So you can put an at symbol there. What's STA again? Yeah. Is it? Um, Science AU. Yeah. Thank you. Science Thank you. Sorry, I had a blank yes. from here. Yeah, we all have blanks. Now, I only click enter just because I'm not sure what enter does at that point. Um, so what I've, what I've said is it's just a little um, boring factual tweet that, said, that just gives a little bit of factual information. Now, what might be useful right now is for me to get a link to the program so that people who are interested in finding out more about what's going on and putting that link in there. You could just copy that from the, uh, the text at the top of the browser. And after that, 
you can hit tweet. I won't, Melanie. Ah, yeah. oh, you want me to? No, I'm not saying I want you to. Don't do it. I've got permission. Do it, no, once do you've it, got permission, it. then you know you've got to act, otherwise people think you're I don't know something like that. And so there you'll see it's appeared up there on the screen. Uh, Dr. At Willow's app is delivering a moderately stimulating presentation on Twitter for the wonderful Science AU, which is great. Um, so uh, right now that's gone out, and the number of people that follow the ANU Research Skills page, which is 951 followers, are able to see that. Now it's public, so. Anyone else can see that. Every single tweet has its own hyperlink. Every single tweet has its own web address that you can, that you can link directly to. But the 951 followers means that people have decided, I want to know enough about ANU research skills that if I log into Twitter, it'll appear in my Twitter feed here. In the same way that ANU research skills is following this person and this person and this person, it will appear in their feed. Now, how many of them have seen it so far? I, don't, I really don't know. Probably not very many. Um, I, I would assume that of the 951 followers, maybe, maybe 100 might be logged into Twitter right now. It, 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 you really couldn't say. And 100 might have seen, um, seen it, but probably not that many. Um, and there is a chance that at some stage soon someone might reply. I could probably reply to that because it'll ping into my phone. So any questions on those Twitter basics just there? So you've, you've got a... You can't have an alert system that tells you, you know, uh, you've got a, you, effectively you've got a message when you're not logged in. So oh, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, just on my phone, using a different Twitter client, but most Twitter clients will do this, and I, I think the, the actual Twitter client will do it. Whenever I get mentioned, um, it pops up on my phone. Um, it, it ends up feeling a little bit like a text message. It's just using a, a different system, but it pops up on my phone, so I, I can see that tweet just there, and I'll reply to it saying... Um, it's terrible watching someone actually type into a phone while they're delivering a presentation, so I won't do that. I've, I've awkwardly typed enough so far, but, I could, but that tweet has popped up into my feed straight away, which is one of the, the important things to do. If you are, um, you don't necessarily have to um, be following all your fe uh, feed the whole time, but knowing when someone mentions you is a really useful thing. It could be to mention your science, to mention something great that you've done, or as um, Natasha mentioned before, it could be to mention um, how awful you are. And it's worth finding out as quickly as possible so that you can learn a bit more about what's going on there. Any other questions about that so far? How much, uh, I don't want to ask all the questions, so how much do you get set up you know, by things like your students? You know, they, they sit there in a lecture, they're, they're a bit bored, you haven't been quite as interesting as you usually are. You know, Will's an absolute deal. Um, it happens, it happens. I think, I think remembering that um, Everything that's tweeted is, in a sense, public. Yeah. Um, people are uh, not. They, I, I'd certainly say that some people do play a game and and, and are happy to to tease and to um, do that kind of thing. But because it's public, you get a kind of um, closer approximation to normal civil society. It's not. It's not the same politeness as we've got right here. Um, but it's not the Wild West where everyone is completely anonymous and you can do exactly what you want. It does come back to people, so people are quite hesitant to go further. Tony? How much of your day do you spend on Twitter? How much of my day? Yes. Um, now, this is uh, a, uh, an interesting question. I don't... I have Twitter open all the time on my computer. When my computer is open, in the way that people have an email program open, they might have their calendar open, um, a browser for um, whatever work I'm doing. Um, I'll have Twitter all, all the time open on, my, uh, on a site, the side of my computer. Um, how much attention am I giving it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a tricky thing to say. I don't make a conscious choice to click open a browser in a way that some people would. I have it running the whole time, and if, if my eyes glance over and I see an account that is interesting to me or I see a word that is interesting to me, then I'll look forward, uh, look a little bit more. I think it's, um, and this is, this is a point that I, I really think is an important point to make, that one of the things that we're advocating in terms of scientists embracing Twitter is that the basics that I've just taught is actually about how to say something. But I think far more important, and this is the same for when we're children and we're learning to talk, it's important to learn to listen before we can say something. And for me, Twitter is, is by far the fastest place where I can, under, I can get new news, 
I can learn what's going on in the world, and I can see sort of fluctuations and trends in what's happening in, in Australian society. Now, for someone that does research on the relationship between science and society, and um, I write about that often in the conversation, but in other, other websites as well, that's quite important to me. It might not be important to other people, I, and, and I completely accept that. It's not necessarily um, something that a lot of people should do. But for me, I get a lot of value actually out of listening to it. And I think that one thing that I would advocate that, that working scientists do, do a little bit more of is listening to end users of their potential research, the journalists who might be covering their field. And this is, this is by far the fastest place to get contact with journalists. There, there is no other place to get, get fast contact with a journalist. I mean, there's quite a few people I often write on the communication of climate change type issues and, and energy. And I know quite a few journalists there who I'm, I'm on friendly terms with because of Twitter. And I find that incredibly value. So there's a question there and then, then up the back. Are you familiar with, I think, was uh, the case of a professor uh, who used to be at Western Australia who actually published some data uh, and results on climate change and uh, the conspiracy theorists got hold of his um, research, didn't like what he said, and it went relatively ugly from there. Mm. I'm not familiar with that particular case. Um, but there are so many like it that, that I can certainly talk about similar examples. Um, there are a lot of this, because it's in some senses a bit, little bit like the Wild West, there are a lot of people who will be free and open with their opinion that they think that um, our research is not legitimate, is bad, is whatever. And that, that can mean that it can be um, quite a frightening space. Um, my research isn't... Uh, the most contentious. I talk about more communication type things. I, do, I talk about communication of climate change, but I know that a lot of climate change researchers um, are closer to a more hostile area. A colleague of mine writes on Doctor Who and has, has received really nasty things. And so I know that social media enables this an, an awful lot. And so I think we do need to develop tougher hides if we are involved in those. Most, most scientists are not involved in, in really contentious sorts of things. Most scientists are working on things that, that have application to um, interest in the rest of the world, possible application or something like that, but mostly it's not that contentious. But there are some of us that do need to learn that. And so I know, um, for example, Will Steffen um, has said there's no way he's going near social media and blogs and, and things like that because um, he would spend all day cleaning his feed out from people that are just utterly hostile. Or he could go an anonymous account, but, you know... That's a bit tricky too. There was a question out the back, but if this is on topic, do you want to... Do you want to... Well, I just wanted to know, um, obviously you can link things to it, and I saw somebody had a, had a tweet to say that the, you could link, uh, uh, there's a, a, a movie yes. on Tudor London or something like that that you could do, and you can link those movies and things like that to, to a, an actual tweet. Absolutely. Um, you can, that obviously takes a lot more Twitter has, skill. Um, potentially, Twitter has a built-in um, uh, photo um, linking thing, so that if you wanted to put a photo, um, you notice when I click the Compose Tweet button, there is a, um, a little camera thing there. So, so it could grab a picture and put that straight up for you. If, if you want to do a video, the, probably the best place to do it is to upload that to a, video, a dedicated video site like YouTube. So just moving on, have you, uh, have you seen people put data up there or something like that? Um, this, is, this is an interesting one. I know people do, um, and data is a little bit difficult to, to get into a tweet. Now, there's an interesting one that, that, um, that I, uh, a tweet that I put out a couple of years ago. There was a silly conversation about, um, in a budget, there would be a, ta a new tax on the slaughtering of a pig, and people called it the bacon tax. And I, I, I just thought, okay, well, how much, does a, how much does a pig cost at slaughter? How much does it work out? What does the tax work out to be per rasher of bacon? I did all of the working out in one tweet, because it's, it's only a few simple numbers, and you can work that out. So that's not data, but that's a scientific argument in a whole tweet, or a, at least an economic argument. So I guess where I'm trying to get to in the end is, is that, does that count as a publication? Well, not peer-reviewed. Not peer-reviewed. No, so, but some journals would argue that they won't actually accept... Potentially. If I was, if I was involved in contentious... Um, it, 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 I would not publish data. Um, or a movie. I mean, a movie is basically intellectual property can be, can be. and has science. I would choose very carefully the reasons for publishing things. I, I actually did um, publish something that on Twitter that I, um, I've got now under submission. I published a very rough draft because I was surprised at it straight away. I, I, wasn't, I was playing around at night looking at two 
um, a graph of something, and I noticed a, an incredible similarity to another graph. Just a, It would just be a correlation. I didn't do any of the numbers at that time. All I did was um, line them up and, and say, hey, this is really interesting, or an equivalent sort of thing. Quite a few people said, wow, that's really interesting. I went back and, and did the numbers and did, did it all properly and have submitted that to a paper, uh, to a journal. Sorry. Uh, now, would a journal say that I published that before? I don't think so, because I didn't put publish... Um, actually rigorous uh, data. All I had done is, is show two graphs right next to each other and suggest, well, that's an interesting, a potentially interesting correlation. It's a, a certainly a dumb thing to do if, um, if you want to keep all of your, your research back until it's been properly peer-reviewed. It was just that it surprised me so much right then, um, and I hadn't been thinking of doing research in that space at all, that I thought, oh, I'll get it out there and, and get a response to it straight away. You had a question out the back? Our constitution is laying out quite clearly who can speak on behalf of our association. So we're running anything like uh, Twitter or Facebook through our website. And should there be any contentious is issues popping up in the debate, do you have any recommendations for monitoring, directing, dealing with... Well, the, the first recommendation I'd say... Um, and this is something I was briefly talking to Melanie before, there's a tendency amongst a lot of organisations to associate social media with youth. Um, I don't believe that's true at all. Uh, but but there, is, there is some idea that, that people that are good at social media are young. Now, I think we should turn that around incredibly. Um, if, if we think of Twitter as um, the modern press release, that's, that's all that it is, would you put your, um, the youngest person in the office, the, the work experience kid in charge of um, your Twitter feed? I really don't think so. I would be putting um, the CEO or whoever's in charge of marketing or someone who is quite senior and understands all of the messages. And to keep, to keep responsibility for messaging on social media, or at least, um, at least setting the tone for what the message is um, at, at quite a senior level. Now, in terms of monitoring what's going on, um, you can certainly set up, uh, like Natasha was mentioning before, um, in Google, you can, you can set up um, things to notice when you're mentioned. Um, similarly in Facebook, you can um, notice when you're mentioned there. Um, a lot of these tools are building that in now for you because they know that a lot of brands all around the world are very interested in, in knowing what the conversation is about them. Uh, Coca-Cola is obviously investing lots of money in finding out what the conversation is about them. And Twitter is happy to try and facilitate that. Uh, so you can, you, you can set up searches, you can obviously get notifications when you are expressly mentioned, um, and that's quite a valuable thing to do, and I'd very much recommend it. Um, it helps, e even if, if you're still at the listening phase, I think it's a really important thing to do, to know what people are talking about you. I think what Sabine, the point, the point Sabine is making though, is she's concerned that, um, uh, that in, anyone can tweet under the handle of, of the organisation, and that's not true, is it? A, a, an authorised person to, to use the, you know, the science AU yes. hashtag, I mean, what will happen is you'll send out a tweet, mm. then other people will respond, especially if it's contentious. So it's very hard to control. You can't control the conversation, but you can control what you say in the first place. Mm. But you've got to accept that, you know, once you're out there, you start a conversation that you have no control over at all. And if you're concerned about that, you shouldn't do it in the first place. Yeah. But no one else can tweet on your handle. No, unless they've got your password. You've granted them authorisation to do so. Yeah. But I, I was also concerned, say, if um, somebody's putting up something or replies to something and, and journalists pick things up fairly quickly, then that they might misinterpret it as something coming from our association. But, um, um, it's, 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 it's journalists understand it. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Journalists, journalists are quite good, but, but they do make mistakes. And there, there are a lot of people, um, either for fun or for political gain, um, pretending to be other people on Twitter. Um, common, common ones are fake versions of, of politicians. Um, so there's a lot of Tony Abbott um, accounts and a lot of fake Tony Abbott accounts. Most of them are glaringly obvious. The clever ones actually um, can be quite tricky about it, and I have seen high-level working journalists uh, retweeting a fake account. And that, that's, for a journalist, that's a, that's a massive faux pas. That's, that's not getting a verified understanding of, of, of what they're passing on as true, true knowledge. Um, it does happen. It can happen. It's probably unlikely to happen um, in, a, in a research space, um, although there will be people out there who are, for example, if you are involved in climate research, there are um, trolls that are attempting to fake climate research and, and um, 
play the other foot. So it is something to be pay attention to, but I wouldn't be too concerned about it. But it does point to another very important question. When you decide to tweet, and if you decide to tweet on a particular contentious issue, so we use it often, frankly, as a press release, because it is the fastest way to get to a journalist. So when the new cabinet was announced and there was no named science minister, we tweeted pretty much instantaneously and gained a lot of coverage from that. If you decide to do it, you are then going to spark something off, which may well become a story, and you've got to make sure you want that story, that story is actually in your interests. So, you know, it's not just a nice little chit chat. Yes. If there's anything contentious about something that's current, it will turn into a story, and you've, you've particularly started that. Particularly, and this is talking on Katrina's example here, if you're tweeting from a, um, a, an organisational or a, or a peak body um, perspective, you know, that working journalists are interested in um, uh, STA's position on various science-related issues. They're, they're far less interested, in my opinion, on those sorts of things, but occasionally moderately interested. Um, so working journalists would ignore 99% of, of, of what I tweet, but... They do accept, and I think this is an important point to make, that for a lot of scientists, there is a blend between being, um, being working scientists and having key knowledge about a specific area and also being human. A good friend of mine on Twitter is a cancer scientist who, who definitely comments on a number of aspects of the research space. Obviously, he knows a lot about cancer research, but also about NHMRC funding and similar issues like that. But he's also tweeting about the cricket right now. And I think that's okay, depending on what you want to do. He's, he's happy to show a bit of personality to fit in with the tone of what, what the rest of society is doing. And then, and this is an advantage, to fit in with the tone and, to, and if there is a moment when the conversation turns to cancer, and I doubt that cricket and cancer have a great overlap, he's there and ready. He's the person that, that people will turn to if that's what they want. <coughs> do we have any other questions? I've sort of covered lots of, lots of Twitter basics. Um, are there any... I, I think one of the other things to, to worry, uh, not worry about, but pay attention to is, um, as Natasha was mentioning, when, th when things go wrong, um, and it can happen uh, quite accidentally, and I think um, paying attention to that, and this is like PR, um, apologising for offence. I, just this afternoon, uh, made a mistake on Twitter. I used a word I shouldn't have done, and uh, I was truthfully reporting what someone else had, had said, and it's a word, I said schizophrenia, um, to describe, uh, this, this scientist has, has used the word schizophrenia to describe um, two different approaches. And that's, and that's, and that's not, it's, it's, a, it's a common term, but it's not um, a, a polite way to, to describe this situation. It, it's a word that he wouldn't have chosen, um, I think, if he had a chance to think about it a bit more. Um, I, made, I made what I think now is clearly the wrong decision to report accurately what he said. I could have reported um, a, a polite version, reporting what he meant to say rather than what he did. Either way, um, it was adding, adding something offensive to the, to the conversation out there on Twitter and, and someone um, called me on it rightly, absolutely rightly. Uh, and I think recognising that things, things can happen like that because this is a it's a public forum, and apologising and owning it is an important thing to do. But mostly, if you're sensible about, what, about what's going on, these things aren't really going to happen so much. Well, can you comment a little bit on the contrast between tweeting from a sort of institutional perspective or a scientific society perspective and a personality perspective? Because we keep, at, at STA, we keep quite a rigid divide between those two. Absolutely. Sort of, so when using the science AU hashtag, I would never talk about myself. Absolutely. I just, it's not appropriate. And, and, and I would encourage none of the executives to talk about themselves. I completely but agree. Is that um, it's not. It's not unbelievably old-fashioned. No, not at all. I think. I think w when you are clearly a, a person, a scientist who is a, who is a person, you're allowed to have. A, you're a citizen. You're allowed to have expertise in a particular area and a range of other opinions. Representative bodies or, or organisations have a brand that is far more precise, far more um, something that they are. They are just talking about. And I think that's that's an an incredibly important thing to remember. That keeping the division between personal tweeting and professional tweeting, they might blend if you're a, if you're a working scientist, but for organisations, I think maintaining the brand is an incredibly important thing. There's an important point to make on this as well, and this is a, a little, um, there is an, a nice trick here. Um, there's a story in uh, the 2012 elections in America where uh, a large brand, I think it was KitchenAid or something like that, uh, accidentally tweeted something hostile about Obama during the middle of an election. Now, obviously, KitchenAid as a, an appliance maker, I doubt they actually have really an opinion on, on politics. They, they might, but it certainly wouldn't be something they'd want public. 
What had happened is the person that was running their account accidentally tweeted a personal opinion, and they were a personal user of Twitter, and I'd, I'd probably advocate that you know, having someone that understands how Twitter works is good um, to have running the brand, but accidentally tweeted it from the wrong account. What I would very much suggest, um, a lot of different Twitter clients will allow you to change between, um, between the, the, the account that you're tweeting from. Um, quite easily. I would suggest if you're running um, an account that you want to keep them rigidly separate is use different Twitter clients. Never, never log in, never, I mean potentially you could use um, different machines. You might have a diff one laptop for tweeting from that account and not that you want to really do that but keeping them as rigidly separated as possible so that you know if you are going to tweet something personal it's coming from your personal account. If you're going to tweet something from your work um, perspective then it needs to um, come with a very different voice. So it's an easy thing to do. It happens. It happens and the consequences are, uh, well, for people that accidentally do it, they're, they're instantly fired. Um, and, you know, I assume aside from losing their job, that person caused enormous amount of distress for the, for the whole company. Um, often, though, it does depend that you are, um, how contentious that opinion is in the first place. If you're just saying, I'm watching the cricket, I don't think... If, if Westpac, for example, accidentally tweeted, I'm watching the cricket, I doubt anyone would jump all over Westpac. They, you know, it's, that's not a problem. If, if the person running the Westpac account accidentally um, you know, tweeted something racist or something like that, that would be a, a very big problem very quickly. And you can, like, if you do notice straight away, right, you can delete the tweet. You can. But you can't, really. You, you, you say you can't, but it has gone from your feed. It has gone from other people's feed, right? If you do Technically, you, you kind of can, um, in the sense that you can remove it from appearing in people's feeds, but you aren't deleting it from the web, in the sense that if they've got the exact um, link, then it stays out there. That's published, and, and, and that will be out there. A lot of people will screenshot. Um, if something is content, and they'll screenshot very quickly, um, because they know that, that deleting it... So I would, I would very much work on the idea that you can't delete a tweet. You, you just it, because once something is out there, it's it's out there on the web and oh sure sure in the, in those sorts of, you know a spelling mistake or something I think that's that's absolutely fine you can work on that principle but if it's something that people would very much want to see and grab onto unfortunately you can't delete that tweet. One of the things we grapple with is um, I teach veterinary science and, and towards the end of their career they do a lot of oral exams. Mm. And so, you know, to get through the 130 it takes us about three days wow. worth of work. You know, these kids just can walk out now, Twitter it and the rest of the the rest of the class has got the questions we ask or, or whatever. I mean, is there any way you can protect against Twitter use in, in, in any sense um. in that sort of thing, situation? I think, I think this isn't just a, a thing that's prone to Twitter. I think that um, right now, everyone has the ability, because of um, various social media and because of the web in general, to spread knowledge that is of value to other people really quite quickly. And you know, coming to your example of, of the, the vet questions, um, I don't think you're, you're as able to protect that. You know, one, one thing in, in their defence is it's probably not in their interests to tell all, all of their classmates how to, you know, to give their classmates an advantage. So there is that working in your favour. Um, you can, there might be ways you could use some sort of technological solution or you might be able to ask questions that, that knowing, knowing in advance wouldn't help. But I think, I think it is a, it's an ongoing problem that, that people are able to spread knowledge. Um, well, it's great that people can spread knowledge. It's just there's, there's times and places where we want to stop that a little bit. Yeah, and the other example we get is they'll set up Facebook pages when they're studying before the final, mm. and they'll trade information across that. Mm. And you, you're correcting the exam, and you see the same wrong information yeah. three times. Yeah, Because they didn't get it right. Yeah, So whoever absolutely. posted it, you know, Got it totally and, right. and, and, and I, so think, I think in that sense, we totally have to right. teach in that, in that context. We have to teach with that knowledge. You know, it's something that, that I remember from, from school where, where a teacher would say, you know, you might be you're cheating off someone. You don't know that they've got the right answer. You know, it, they, they, it doesn't really advantage you unless you know they've got the right answer. And I think, I think letting, letting um, students know that sharing, an, sharing something on Facebook um, will notice when it appears in an, in an essay or something over and over again. Um, but also, if it's wrong... I'll follow you.
Right. That's it, Will. Oh, right. <laughs>